I'm here in Iceland playing a strong international chess tournament. In my second round, I played against an unrated opponent, but don't be fooled. He plays in the US, it's his first international tournament, but he's played chess for 20 years. Here's how it went. So I started with d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, and here he played a6. I was really excited because this was the line that I had prepared. Yesterday my preparation was terrible, but today it actually hit. So I took the pawn in the center, he recaptured, and here the line I had prepared was bishop to g5. I had found his games on Lee Chess and chess.com, and he almost always played bishop e6 here, which is what he played in the game as well. I found this tricky line where I capture the knight, and I was expecting him to take with the queen, which I would then play queen b6, putting pressure on both of these two pawns, and getting into a really tricky line where black's best move is rook a7. But instead of taking with the queen, he ended up taking with the pawn, which already ruined his pawn structure, and I was feeling confident in the opening, already knowing that I should be slightly better. What the? Okay, the guy just took back with a pawn. Okay, so uh, good news, bad news situations, people. Um, Alexandra is out of her prep at this point. Uh, the good news is she has a massive advantage. That being said, I didn't really prepare for this line because it was supposed to be bad. So I kind of had to improvise my ideas here. And I played queen to b3. I thought that I could do the same plan I would have done if he took with the queen, but apparently this was not the most correct plan. What I should have been doing here is playing for this c5 square, which was now very weak, with ideas like queen c7, knight to h4, d3, e3, bishop d3, and then putting my knight onto f5 in the future. The whole idea here is when he has a worse pawn structure, he can't kick me out anymore. But I didn't know that, so instead I played queen b6, and here he continued with knight d7. I couldn't take the pawn, I was pretty sure I might actually end up losing my queen here after a move like knight b6, and then if I do check, he would be able to block with the bishop, and I didn't see where I'd be able to get my queen out, and even if a move like this didn't work, he still would be able to move his rook to b8 and then recapture my pawn, and I didn't like the kind of compensation he would get. So this pawn was a poison pawn. Don't take it. So here I continued with e3. I wanted to free up my bishop. He developed his bishop as well. And here I played g3, which wasn't a great move because you usually don't want to play e3 and g3. My bishop is only going to go on one side of the board, so I shouldn't have done that. I was just really worried about his rook coming to g8 and putting pressure, so I wanted to get rid of that and give myself the option of pianchettoing. So I played here, and now he played knight to b6. I thought this was a good move because it was controlling the square on c4. Not that I would use it, but maybe he'd be able to put his knight there in the future. And I also thought that with this move, he was protecting his pawn on b7 and maybe having some kind of pawn break with c5 in the future. So here I pushed a4, which apparently was a mistake. Um, I was trying to kick his knight out of here and push my pawn forward, but the reason why it was a mistake is because he was able to push a5, and then even though it weakened his b5 square, it also weakened my b4 square, which he would later use for his bishop. I continued with rook to d1, and my whole idea with this was that I didn't want him to push his pawn to c5, and if he would do this, I figured that after I take, let's say he recaptures, I get my bishop out check, he can't block because he'll lose a pawn. He'd have to move his king to the center of the board and I figured if he's not able to castle, I will and then I'll try to open the center and this looks really good for me. I was trying to make it hard for my opponent to have any kind of counterplay. Here he played bishop to b4. So he was pinning my knight. He was also blocking any pressure I had on the knight. This was an excellent move by him. I didn't like this 
pressure on my knight, and I also was considering fianchettoing my bishop, but I didn't want to do that because then his knight would have the c4 square. So I decided to move my knight to d2 to defend this square um, and to also get away from the pin. It was kind of a passive move and it ended up not being the most accurate one, but it was very hard for him to figure out why. He then continued with queen to d7, he's preparing to castle, he's looking towards my king side, and he's also putting pressure on the weak a4 pawn. So I played bishop to b5, you know, hoping for a Bota's gambit, of course it didn't work out, he played c6, and then I moved my bishop back onto e7. As you can see, it's kind of awkward that I have this pawn on g3 when I'm not able to fianchetto, but again, at least I don't have to worry about rook coming to g8. Here, he found a tricky move. He played bishop to h3, and I instantly played f3 because I had been planning to put my king on f7 since it felt a lot safer than castling. Even though it's not a real castle and all of my pawns are on the third rank, it's actually extremely hard for black to crack through. That being said, this was my biggest mistake of the game. He had a really good plan, and I'll explain it right now, but it's going to make more sense as the game continues. Okay, so this is totally a computer move. He should have played queen to c7. The idea with this is that I can never push my pawn to try to trap his bishop because he would just attack my rook, and once I move, he would gobble up the pawn on a2. The other good thing that this move does is that it defends the knight. His bishop on b4 is extremely strong, so he doesn't want to let me trade it off with moves like knight a2. But the problem is, if the queen stays on d7 and I play the knight on a2, he cannot move his bishop because then the knight is not left protected. So if he would have played queen to c7, he would have been in a better position. Lucky for me, he was afraid of trapping his bishop on h3. That's not something he should have been worried about. He pushed the pawn to h5, and I instantly played my king to f7. Honestly, I wanted to get my king there anyway. Here he made basically the biggest mistake of the game, and it doesn't even seem like it should be a mistake, but he castled here. And if you remember what I was talking about earlier, about the bishop and the knight, you might guess my next move. Knight to a2. And here, the rest of the line was pretty forced for him. He couldn't move his bishop, and he had to defend it. So he moved his queen up, I traded off the pieces, and he recaptured, and I figured that his pawn structure here is really bad. I mean, starting on the king side, he has an isolated pawn, two double isolated pawns, and now he doubled yet another pawn. You know, before the tournament, Hammer told me that he wanted me to play a game that showed that I could take advantage of weak pawn structures, and I think this was the one. I actually instantly played b3 just thinking that I should connect my pawns and I missed the fact that I could have pushed the pawn to a5, kicked his knight out and then brought over my rook to a1 with the idea of going to a4 to win his pawn. This would have been better than what I did. Mine was a slight deviation on it and it made it more complicated for me, but I still played the rest of the game almost flawlessly according to Hammer who almost never says that by the way. Okay. So I continued with b3, and here he wasted another move, he played bishop to f5. Again, he was afraid of his bishop being trapped, that's a ghost threat. He was afraid of a ghost threat, because even if I would have tried to trap his bishop here with a move like g4, he could have taken pawn takes and then challenged my pawn one more time, and his bishop would never have any worries. So what he should have done instead is move his king up to c7 in anticipation of what I was going to do next, which I'll just show you. So here my plan was to try and put pressure on the base of his pawn chain because if I'd be able to trade off the pawn on b7, he'd have a backwards pawn on c6 which would be a lot easier to attack. My other plan was similar to what I should have done earlier in the game. It was pushing a5 and getting my rook over to the a4 square to try to win his weak pawn on b4. So I played a5, he had to move his knight back, I brought my rook to the semi-open file, he moved up his king to prepare his rooks to come onto the semi-open file as well. I played rook to a4 attacking the pawn, 
He played rook to a8. I couldn't take the pawn because he would recapture my pawn on a4. So I doubled up, and here he found a really strong move, the only move that would let him save his pawn. The move b5, exclamation mark, even if his position still lost, it was great that he found this, and I wouldn't be able to capture the pawn on b4 because he would play knight to b8 with the idea of knight a6 trapping my rook. So my only option here was to take en passant. He took back with the knight, which was the only way to protect his rook twice, to not lose a piece. And here, I wanted to keep my pressure on the open file, and I also wanted to put pressure on the 7th rank. So for rooks, the dream is get an open file and get the 7th rank. So I played rook to a7 check. He couldn't trade off my rook because I would end up winning the pawn on f7, so he instead had to move his king over to d6. And here I played rook 1 to a6 to force him to trade off and give me this open file. I was attacking his knight, um, and there was nothing else he could do except for trade my rook, and then here I recaptured. I was actually pretty afraid of this position. He had one move that I thought would give him a ton of counterplay. That move was rook to a8. And after rook to a8, it looks like I have a lot of options. There's a free pawn on f7, I'm looking towards b7, but I actually can't necessarily take on f7 because he attacks my rook and defends his pawn. And even if I bring my rook back to b7 to attack his knight after, he has a move like rook to a2, putting pressure on my knight. And even if I end up winning material at the end of this variation, I'm just up a pawn and actually, I mean, this, this, this looks like it would be worse for me. I wouldn't even be able to take the pawn here. Um, okay, yeah, so this line wouldn't work. Instead, I would have had to play a different line, which I did look at. So instead, I would have had to play a move like rook to b7, attacking his knight, and then if he played rook to a2, attacking mine, um, what, what did I think that I was going to play here? Oh, I, I, I was even considering moves like e4 here. Honestly, this line was so tricky that I thought I might have to trade off the rook and try to win this endgame, which would, which would have been extremely difficult even though he has a bad pawn structure. It's actually a good lesson. When you are in a worse position, you want to go for the trickiest lines. And my opponent explained to me that he didn't realize that he was losing, so that's why he focused instead on trying to save the pawn, and he ended up playing rook g6. But it's really important to sit, evaluate where you are in a position, especially in endgames, and know if you're fighting for a draw, and know if you're worse or drawn. Because if you know you're worse here, then it makes sense to go for the trickier line where your opponent can make mistakes. After he played bishop here, the rest of the game was a lot more straightforward for me. So here, I moved my rook to b7, attacking his knight. He had to move it, and I was able to recapture a pawn. Now he played his rook to a8, finally going for the open file. I did not want to give it to him, so I played rook to a4. He could have considered trading off, but I would be up a pawn and have a pass pawn, and his pawn over here in the corner would be pretty weak. So he decided not to trade it, and I understand why. He played rook to b8 here, and what I noticed is that this pawn on h5 was going to become weak later on, but I didn't want to allow him to push h4 and make me win the pawn by creating isolated double pawns of my own. So I played a4 while I still had the chance so that I could cement his weakness into h5. Here he played bishop to c2, attacking my pawn, I just moved the rook back one square to defend it. and. My next move would have been a move like f5 to go and win the pawn on h5. That's the reason why he had to push f5 here. His idea was to try to get the knight into f6. And here I decided, you know what, I'm going to give you this pawn. I played my rook to a7, he took, and by taking he actually freed up the d6 square for my bishop, and there was no good way for him to try to defend his pawn. He did try though, of course. Rook to a7 was kind of strange because now you can capture the pawn. Ooh, but actually, look at this. How clever is she? So he played king to e6, and I looked at the variation with bishop takes f5. It ended up not being very good. So instead, I played rook to a6, 
putting pressure on this pawn. He couldn't defend with the rook because I would just trade off and win the bishop at the end. So the only option for him was to play king to d6. So here I finally got my pawn um, and his position is starting to get really hard. He doesn't have a lot of good moves. And the reason why he doesn't have a lot of good moves is because my plan is to put my bishop back on d3 and his bishop is actually almost stuck. If he moves it to d1, I just attack it with my king and he cannot defend it with his rook. So the only move he'd have in the future after I attack it with rook a3 is coming to c4. So he would lose another pawn. For this reason, and because he was getting really low on the time, he was about like two minutes or so, he tried the sneaky move rook to c2. And I like that he tried this because if I would have taken, he would have played rook to b2 and I think this position would have given him some pretty good chances. Of course, I was not about to give him chances, I just wanted a nice clean win. So I pushed e4 here, and this was starting to get very beautiful. His king was in the center of the board and I was salivating over potential checkmates. I thought if he plays something like rook to b7, then I get rook to b2, then I get rook to a7, threatening checkmate, and once he defends it, I even have pawn pushes. Super, super dangerous. So, because I was threatening rook to a7, he defended with his rook to b7, I pushed with check. Wow, she's really executed this end of the game so nicely, so nicely. And here, this was his last move before he'd get another half an hour, he played king to e7, which just let me recapture the bishop because he wouldn't be able to pin it since I would be able to capture on c6. That being said, I was actually going to win a piece even if he played king c7, and this was a, a cool looking tactic. I would recapture the bishop, rook goes to b2, check the king, if he attacks me, I just take his knight, and if he tries to defend the knight, I attack it one more time with my bishop, and once he recaptures my knight, I move my king up, attacking his rook and knight at the same time, and he would lose a piece here as well. He ended up resigning shortly after he lost a piece, which I really appreciated because it's a double round and we're both trying to keep our stamina for round two. I ended up playing with 94.1% accuracy, my opponent played with 88.6, I know I messed up the opening, but I think I played the rest of it pretty well. I feel good, and I'm looking towards round three. Thank you guys so much for watching.